so teaching is a really important job, right? How many of you out here have ever been a teacher? Wow, all right. Well, you probably also know that teaching is really stressful. But if you've never been a teacher, you might not really understand why it's challenging. So I'd like to invite you to imagine what it might be like. <laughs> imagine yourself in a room with 25 young children. Recognize that neither you nor your students can leave this room, so you're virtually captive. If you walk out, you'll get fired. If your kids walk out, they get in trouble too. Now, if you're lucky, only about a third of these kids have a lot of challenges going on in their lives that make it difficult to learn. And it's your job to teach them every day language arts, math, science, social studies. <sighs> but it's really hard to get their attention, right? <laughs> Feel a little stressed? Yeah. So, what do you think that stress does to you day after day after day? How do you think it affects your ability to teach and your students' ability to learn? Well, you may know that there's a really growing recognition that teacher stress is a big problem. Uh, job satisfaction is plummeting, and we're really facing a serious teacher shortage. So we really need to start thinking about why this uh, environment is stressful and how to help teachers. So when I became a teacher, before I became a teacher, as, I, as Matt mentioned, I had my own mindfulness practice. So as I began teaching, uh, I think that mindfulness really helped me manage those stresses. But then I became a teacher educator, and I started supervising student teachers, and I spent 15 years observing teachers regularly. And I started to notice that sometimes teachers get stressed out and they overreact to situations. They overreact to behaviors. And I started being really interested in that. And, I, and, I, and that's when it dawned on me that my own mindfulness practice had helped me with that issue. But I didn't understand what was going on well enough to, to help teachers. So I went back to school and I earned a doctorate in human development. When I studied the stress response, it all started to make sense to me. Because when you put people in a room, and you virtually make them captives, and you, in the room has a lot of emotional energy in it, and there's all these other demands in terms of remembering content and delivering content and keeping track of who's doing what, it's very attentionally and emotionally demanding. So we really need to find new ways to manage the stress response in the classroom. So the stress response helps us deal with threat uh, to fight or to run for our lives, the fight-flight response. Uh, the limbic system of the brain triggers a flood of hormones throughout our whole body that give us this extra boost of strength to help us survive. And all the body's resources are harnessed to address that threat. And functions that are not necessary for immediate survival can go offline. So there's this part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, that's really important to teaching and learning. It's where we do planning and judgment and, and that kind of work. That goes offline, and it can impair teaching and learning. So this became really clear to me that we needed to find a way to address the stress response as it occurs in this classroom context. The other thing I realized is, Looks a little scary, huh? <laughs> the stress response evolved to help us deal with lions, to deal with real physical threats. But today, most of the threat that we experience is psychological threat, where our lives are not necessarily threatened. So for example, as a teacher, I might feel threatened if a student disrupts my lesson when I'm trying to finish before the bell rings. So I can start feeling annoyed and frustrated, which is a signal that the fight response is starting to rise. But that response has not helped me at all to deal with this situation with the student. It can actually make things worse because it distorts my perceptions. When I get angry, I might uh, misinterpret behavior as intentional when it's really not. Uh, I might say something that I later regret. And my anger, might provoke anger and fear in my students 
which we now know disrupts the learning process. So, what do we do? One way to override the stress response is to practice mindfulness. This is me uh, circa 1981, <laughs> a long time ago. So, when we are mindful, as many of you know, other people have said, we're aware of what's happening in the present moment, and we cultivate an attitude of curiosity and openness towards our experience. With practice, we start to notice those subtle sensations that signal the onset of the stress response. For me, I start noticing my shoulders go like this. <laughs> Anybody else have that experience? Oh, why are my shoulders over here? Um, you start noticing those little signals, and with that awareness, it helps you calm down. When you start noticing that, you can go, oh, okay, calm down. So with practice, you learn to regulate the stress response so that it doesn't take you by surprise. And you can respond to situations skillfully rather than reacting unconsciously. So I'd like to invite you to join me in a mindfulness practice. This is a very simple, brief practice. It's just taking three deep, mindful breaths. So it helps to sit up, if you're not already, sit up, because you're going to be feeling the sensation of air as it's filling your lungs and entering your nose. And if you want, you can close your eyes or lower your gaze. And you might also want to put your hands on your abdomen. At your own pace, take three very deep, slow breaths, feeling the sensation of the air as it enters your nose and fills your lungs. and as it leaves your body. And when you're done, you can allow your breath to settle back to its normal rhythm. And just notice how you're feeling right now. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. This practice is like turning down a thermostat. It cools that reactivity, and it can be really helpful in contexts where there's a lot of busyness. You can take a moment. Even just one breath can make a big difference. So how can we apply this to helping teachers? My colleagues and I at the Garrison Institute, at Penn State, and Fordham University, and UVA, for the last decade, we've been working to answer this question. And we've created the Care for Teachers program. Uh, and it's intended to help teachers notice, you apply mindfulness to helping them deal with the stress response and provide better support to their students. For the last decade, we've taught over 1,000 teachers worldwide. And with money from two grants from the US Department of Education, we've conducted the most rigorous research to find out, does care work as we expect? Our most recent study was conducted here in New York City with 224 elementary teachers in schools in the upper Manhattan and the Bronx. And we randomly, randomly assigned teachers to receive the CARE program or be in a waitlist controlled group. And the results of this research show that CARE has significant positive impacts on teachers' well-being. Teachers' emotion regulation improved and their mindfulness improved. Their psychological distress went significantly down. And something called time urgency went down. So that, that example I gave you of being interrupted when you're trying to finish a lesson, that's called time urgency. It's the stress you feel when you don't have enough time. We also found that care had significant positive impacts on the social interactions in those classrooms. So we had uh, researchers who were blind to which group the teacher was assigned to go into their classrooms and observe before the care group got their training and afterwards. And what we found was the teachers who had the care training were much better at managing the social uh, relationships in their classrooms. The interactions were more emotionally positive and the teachers showed greater sensitivity to the needs of their students. 
Finally, they also had a more productive use of time for learning. So these results are very exciting because this is the first time anyone's ever been able to affect the classroom environment this way simply by giving support to the teachers. So in my book, Mindfulness for Teachers, I provide stories that some of these teachers have told us about how CARE has helped them. One teacher, uh, we'll call her Ms. Garcia, was having a really tough time with one of her students. We'll call her um, Maria. No, yeah, okay. So uh, Maria was coming to school late every day, and this was really annoying Ms. Garcia. Uh, she would come into the classroom and she would giggle late, and this really annoyed her. Um, she tried scolding her, she put her for time out, nothing was helping with the situation. So she came to the CARE program and she started understanding how to apply mindfulness to her emotions. And she realized that as a child she had been punished for being late and she was projecting that onto Maria. Uh, and her, so when Maria came in late it triggered this emotional reaction from her past experience. Well, you can imagine how she started feeling. Well, she also realized she had never asked Maria why she was coming to school late, so she did. She learned that this little seven-year-old girl was getting herself to school without any adult supervision because her single mom worked late at night and wasn't up to help her. So you can imagine how her emotion shifted from anger to compassion. Rather than becoming angry and punitive, she welcomed Maria to school every day. And it completely transformed their relationship and her readiness to learn. So CARE is an effective, uh, inexpensive, uh, easy to apply uh, way to help our teachers. And I invite you to join me in bringing this issue of teacher stress to the forefront so that we can improve our classrooms. Because how our children learn today affects our future in ways we can't even imagine. Thank you. Thank you.